Hello, everyone. I'm your host, April Hanna, and this is the Path 11 Podcast. Just a reminder, we are offering access to all of our archive shows, which is well over 100 hours of content, and new bonus shows such as the Virtual Book Club, Food for Thought Friday, and the Two Minute Tuesday, all for just $3.99 a month. Think about it, guys. That's less than the cost of a pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks. Sign up for premium for just $3.99 a month. Now let's get to this week's show. So today I'll be speaking to Brian E. Robinson. He is an author of 35 nonfiction books and two novels. His books have been translated into 13 languages, and he's been featured on 2020, Good Morning America, ABC's World News Tonight, NBC Nightly News, NBC Universal, the CBS Early Show, and CNBC's The Big Idea. Robinson also maintains a private psychotherapy practice and lives in the Blue Ridge Mountains with his spouse and four dogs. And today we're going to be discussing his latest book that just came out called Daily Writing Resilience, 365 Meditations and Inspiration for Writers. Welcome, Brian. Well, thank you, April. It's great to be here. Yes, great to have you. And um, I, I'm kind of feeling like our conversation might be a little half and half with your life of being an author and then your life of also being a psychotherapist and how you blend the two. My okay. background is uh, also in mental health therapy. So you and I might have some fun stuff to discuss today. Sounds great. So um, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your inspiration for writing this new book um, and really giving inspiration to writers and giving them something every day for an entire year to kind of get them through the writing process? Well, the inspiration came out of my own painful experience, as many uh, writings do. Um, I hit a wall. I was writing a novel, and there was a, a hole in the novel, as you could have flown a 747 through and I was I was grabbing a fistful of hair I'll never forget it and uh, I was frustrated and at the end and I thought I'm gonna back off from this and I'm gonna use some of the therapeutic techniques that I have learned over the years and that I generally practice and that I show clients and so what I did uh, is, as I calmed myself down and I, and I became less less frustrated, I thought, you know, there are tons of books on craft of writing, but I can't think of anything right now that would help me get through this. So I'm going to write my own. So I left the novel and I started writing uh, just some notes to myself about self-doubt, uh, about perfectionism about believing in my abilities. And so eventually it led from well, January to December, uh, a daily meditation, meaning uh, just a, uh, it starts with a quote. Uh, each page starts with a quote from a well-known writer about not giving up, about perseverance, about resilience. And then there's a little uh, saying uh, that talks about whatever the, the quote uh, introduces. And then there's a takeaway at the end to file away in the back of our minds so that we can keep that with us as we face struggles in life. And by the way, this book has turned out to be, so many people are telling me, hey, this is for me, even though I'm not a writer, this can apply to any field of endeavor or just any obstacle you're trying to face in life. So what happened was I completed the book, my agent sold it, and then I went back and finished the novel because my creative mojo came back online because I wasn't forcing it. And I ended up with two books to boot. So that's, that's that's how it it came to be, and the truth is that I uh, actually go to it once in a while myself uh, if I'm uh, you know frustrated or if I'm uh, facing some kind of uh, hurdle that I'm having trouble getting over, and uh, it, it even helps me. So. Yeah, I bet too. And, you know, that was one of my questions that I was, uh, as I was reading and going through the book, I was wondering, I was like, I wonder if he actually took a full year and th these were his writings, you know, each day along in 365 days. And if you had actually were practicing this yourself and kind of, you know, encouraging yourself and giving yourself these, these pick me ups. 
Yeah, well, a lot of them did come from personal experience over the course of a year. And uh, some days I would write more than one. But um, if I, for example, I, I remember I was um, uh, at, at the supermarket and I bought about $20 worth of, of groceries. And uh, uh, the cashier looked up and said, that'll be $130.45. And I looked over, and a woman behind me hadn't put the stick on the conveyor belt between our groceries. And it took us 20 minutes to get that fixed. And I was in the middle of writing. But you know what? As a result of writing this book, I thought, you know what? I'm going to use this in my novel. This is I'm going to use this to describe how a couple meets. And, ah. <laughs> and, 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 and I felt great. So here's the deal. Resilience is about taking whatever happens, no matter how bad it is or how frustrating, and asking, what can I do with this? How can I turn this around? How can I make this work? What can I learn from this? And that's what helps us get the energy to keep on going and to develop a more positive attitude instead of frowning and kicking and, you know, banging our fist. Yeah. And as, and as a psychotherapist, I mean, the word resilience comes up in, I'm sure, your practice all the time, you know, where we're sitting across from many different types of people that come from different walks of life and have different traumas and stories and how, you know, some clients can have really high levels of resilience and others were kind of looking to build the resilience and help them build that within themselves. That's true. And some of the, the newest uh, research that's coming out actually talks about resilience. And scientists have discovered something called a resi the resilient zone that we have inside of us. Think about this. Grass grows through concrete. Grass grows through concrete. Now, how does that happen? But it does. And that's a scientific fact. We've all seen it. So if grass grows through concrete, that then what's inside of us that we may not even be aware of that we can actually cultivate so that we can um, face life's dramas, you know, with less fear and with less pain and, and, and get through them. So the other thing scientists talk about is something called the negativity bias. And what that is, is that is we're born for survival. We are born to overestimate threats and underestimate our ability to handle them. I'm going to say that again. Overestimate threats and underestimate our ability to handle the threat because that helps us survive. But most of us, or many of us, want to live more than just a survival life. So the key to that is to flip that around, and this is where resilience comes from, and to underestimate threats. Things are never as bad as we, as our mind tells us it's going to be, and overestimate our ability to handle whatever that threat is. And that raises our resilience needle in, incredibly. It's something I practice daily in my life. I'm not always successful because I'm human and, you know, I, I have vulnerable situations, but it has that literally changed my life. And this is something that I write about in the book but I also use in the psychotherapy I do with, with my clients. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing about this book, too, it, it definitely – is an excellent tool, I think, for really helping anyone, like you said, in your life. I mean, there's there's great quotes to meditate on. There's great takeaways. But it can also be a book for somebody who is just starting to tinker with the idea of wanting to write their book. Um, I feel like most people that I've met usually say, I'm going to write a book one day. Or everybody feels as if they have a book inside of them to write. And many usually don't. Or, you know, writers that obviously I interview a lot of writers, it does sound like every time I interview someone, oh, this book took me six years to write. Uh, you know, it seems like writing can sometimes be very painstaking in order for this, a book to be birthed. Well, I always tell people, if you want to be a writer, I hope you enjoy digging ditches. <laughs> <laughs> and sweating and crying and agonizing. Um, but you know what? Uh, those of us who write uh, and stay with it, the other thing is we, we have ink in our blood and we love writing. And, and I think that's the key. If you want to be a writer, you don't have to publish. You're a writer if you write. That's all you have to do is write. But a lot of people have this idea that, um, oh, I'll write when the mood strikes or when I have nothing better to do. And that's not really who a writer is. I write every day. Um, 
even when I go into my office, I'll write five, ten minutes either before or sometime later in the day. Um, and that's really what, what a writer is. And if you're a school teacher, you go teach school. If you uh, work on radio like you do, April, you go to work. Uh, so if you're a writer, if you really want to be a writer, you think of yourself as a writer, you act as a writer, and then you start to feel more like a writer. And actually, it, in, it boosts your self-esteem and your confidence. So, But, but there are many uh, – uh, I just want to say that most of us have a love for writing. That's, that's what we have to stay connected to. But in the trajectory – of getting an agent if you want to publish or if you want to write a book, getting an, an editor, it's painstaking. It's You have to stay in there. You can't give up. I've had so many friends who got impatient and frustrated and finally just gave up and self-published, and which they, they could have, I think, actually done better. They could have actually gotten a publisher. But if you really want to write – you have to stay connected to your love for writing and and not try to think that you're going to get fame and fortune because most of us don't. But it's our love for writing and, and seeing people who enjoy what we have to say that really um, keeps most most of our fires burning. Yeah. And and I'm, I'm curious to know, what do you think it is that makes writing a book so painstaking like what is it in the process why oh, why do we never hear like you know authors and writers saying i wrote this book in about a week <laughs> or yeah. you know it, it it only took three months as opposed to seven years yeah well um the writing itself uh, it is not always the issue, although, you know, some it, writer's block can be. But uh, if we want to take it into the publishing realm, that's where it gets really challenging. Um, every well-known writer that I know of, like Stephen King, J.K. Rowling, uh, Janet Ivanovich, all talk about the rejection. And if you're if you have thin skin and if you take rejection to heart, you can't you will never make it. Uh, you have to have a rhino hide and you have to know that rejection is not personal. It's going to happen. Stephen King had a nail for all of his rejection slips on the wall. The, the nail got so full he had to replace it with a spike. Uh, but look where he is and what he's done. Janet Ivanovich talks about filling a shoebox full of rejections. And once it was full, she took it to the street in front of her house and set it on fire. Those are actually empowering things to do, uh, is when we get rejections. Some people have wallpapered their rooms. Some people have made scrapbooks. But uh, there's actually something empowering about uh, acknowledging the rejections ta and taking from the rejections something that will work and then just leaving the rest there. But don't give up. We take that towel that we want to throw in and wipe the sweat off our face and then keep on going. And it's those people who have done that who have what I call a resilient frame of mind or a, a winning frame of mind who actually get there. And you can look at this in any profession, really. Uh, Babe Ruth said, for those who don't know who Babe Ruth is, he's probably one of the greatest baseball figures who ever lived. His philosophy was every time I strike out, it brings me closer to the next home run. And that's mm -hmm. resilience. And Meryl Streep has it with acting. Billie Jean King has it with tennis. Michael Phelps has it with swimming. We could go, you know, keep going down the list. Uh, people like Steve Barry had 85 rejections. It took him 12 years to get his first novel. And now he's been on the New York Times bestseller list. So the message in the book is life's going to throw us curveballs. And it's not how is life treating us? The question to ask is, how am I treating life? What am I doing with these curveballs? What am I doing with rejection? What am I doing with self-doubt? What am I doing with that critic that we all have in our head? That's where, that keeps us empowered. And, and, and when we stop to think about what am I doing with it instead of what it's doing to me, then it, it builds the resilience and widens our resilience on Right. It's not so much about the details of the events, but how we work through them and how we handle moving through them. That's right. 
Now, so there's the one side of rejection, but then on the other side, I'd like to talk about maybe the inspiration and the spirituality behind writing. I'm, I'm curious to know if you feel that there's even something, you know, greater than yourself that either gives you a push or a nudge or an idea to bring forth material and for you to write. Um, you know, some people that I have interviewed before would talk about automatic writing or channeled writing. Yeah. And I, you know, in my own experience of just writing and journaling, it does feel like that you can go into a bit of a trance state. And, you know, sometimes you may not even recognize what you write until you go back to it, you know, the day after and you reread it and say, gosh, I wrote that. So right. I'm, I'm curious to know your connection with spirituality and your experience of being an author and, you know, writing, I mean, 35, 35 nonfiction books and two novels. You've been busy. I've been very busy. And, you know, I've experienced this more with fiction writing, what you're describing, I've, I've experienced with fiction writing more than nonfiction writing, because they're characters. And um, I've had this, the experience you're describing, and, and many fiction writers do, and that's where you're, you're writing, and then all of a sudden, you, I think the book is going to go one way, and all of a sudden, the characters automatically take over and start writing the book. It's fascinating when that happens, but... The best way to describe it is there, you're in a zone uh, and you're not present with with the reality that we all know. You're somewhere else. And, and all of a sudden, these characters start talking and start uh, deciding how the rest of the book is going to go. And you just go with it. A lot of people call that the muse. Uh, some people call it deep play. Uh, there's a whole book called Deep Play where we get so into that zone, uh, it's it's almost like a high, and uh, we're at, we're not even aware of time, uh, and it can feel like ten or fifteen minutes, and five hours may go by. Uh, but there is something about the the, the spirituality uh, where it feels like that this start after a while that it's coming through you. It's a wonderful feeling. Because you you kind of are you're letting go of of control and trying to make something happen, and it's just happening. It's, so it's just coming through you. I think it's coming. In therapy, we talk about uh, the self versus our parts, and I think what happens from a therapeutic point of view is the critic relaxes, my frustration relaxes, my doubt relaxes. All these parts that that sometimes get in the way just relax and then the self comes through like the sun coming through the clouds and the real me the creativity and it just starts flowing like a river um so we could look at we can also look at it that way but that that's a, a spiritual experience for sure when uh when you when you feel that the other thing i wanted to say about that that kind of ties in is um many of us Right for a reason. Uh, I've talked with so many people who, well known writers, who have had a similar experience to me. Uh, when I was small, uh, uh, I grew up in a, in a pretty tough family. And uh, actually, Gloria Steinem is one of the ones who has shared a, a very similar background to me and talks about her own writing. Uh, and one of the things we both did is to get away from the uh, tumultuous life we lived was we just automatically went into our room and started writing. And I would make up these characters that would take over and I would get them into trouble and then they would get themselves out of trouble. So for me, this process started when I was like eight years old and it helped me survive a, a really tough time. And it also became my best friend. Writing it has always been something that I've loved. Yeah. And I like the way that you describe some of that, too, which kind of leads me into my next statement, maybe question or looking for uh, more validation is how therapeutic writing can be. You know, it really can take you um, to different places. It can be very relaxing, very meditative. And, um, you know, I'm sure probably a lot of my clients are tired of hearing, well, you need to get a journal. Let's start journaling this stuff. Let's start writing some stuff down. And can you kind of describe too what the therapeutic process of journaling does for people who are going through very stressful moments in their life or needing clarification on their life path. Well, it is, it can be therapeutic. Um, 
uh, there's something called free writing that I will often have a client do. And free writing is when if someone has hurt us, uh, we uh, can write to that person. And what we write is, is not to be sent. It's to get get it out from the inside of us. We call it catharsis. Catharsis is a relief uh, of the pain that we're experiencing. So free writing would be where you forget everything your third grade teacher taught you about grammar, spelling, punctuation, and you just let it flow. And what happens, you, you bypass your critic and you bypass all those other things that can get in the way. And you, it, it kind of puts you into a, 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 a certain flow where it just comes out. And once you've done that and, and you don't stop, you just keep writing as fast as you can and just get it all out no matter without any editing at all. It's an incredible relief uh, from the burden of the pain that, that, that we're carrying around. Um, so that's, uh, that's one example. The, the other, you know, writing a, a journal does not have to be, I think that the problem with the people don't often do it is because we already have so much to do. And what I always say, hey, what, a, what about one sentence? If, if you write one sentence a day of, you know, how you're feeling or what's going on, that's all you have to do. And, and people are more inclined to do that. The value is, you know, over a month or two months, you look back and you have a roadmap. And that roadmap shows you, gosh, two months ago I was here and look where I am now. And once you start to see that in black and white, your brain realizes when you get into this valley, you're not always going to be there. Uh, it, there are going to be valleys and mountains, but you're always going to come out of it. So there's there's a lot of value to just seeing the trajectory of your emotions or uh, where are, you are in terms of life events and how you come out of that and go into it. It's just the rhythm and flow of life for all of us. Yeah, and I think anybody that has ever kept a personal journal like that and, you know, went back years later to find an old journal and reading where you were, you know, oh. that it, it brings you that knowledge and um, yeah. oh, right. that, that reflection. Absolutely. It helps you see how much you've grown. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> Now, I'm um, switching gears just a little bit. I obviously didn't get a chance to read uh, one of the books that you're best known for, but I'd like to discuss it a little bit because you've done a lot of work um, in regards to the book that you wrote, Chained to the Desk, a guidebook for workaholics. Um, and, you know, I know that you're pretty well known for that and even coming up with the work addiction risk test. Um, and I, th I think sometimes, you know, as we're all trying to find our purpose, many people will attach to the identity of their careers and what they do. Um, so I'd like you to just uh, talk a little bit about that, because I think our listeners might also be interested in that book as well. Okay, and let me just mention that I just did a podcast with Alanis Morissette. She's a friend of mine, and she also talks about her own work addiction. I, I talk about my own personal struggle with it, and it's free, and it's on her website, alanis.com, if anybody wants to hear more about this whole idea of work addiction and how it impacts our lives. Um, well, that book is written from personal experience. Um, I uh, talk about my own battle with, with work addiction. And, and I've also when, uh, taught at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte, did the first studies on the effects of workaholism on children and the effects of workaholism on, on marriage. And it's the kind of thing most of us think is good. Uh, so why would we look at the, you know, the, it would have a negative effect? Well, the, basically the research that I, over, over a period of time that I concluded was that in some cases, living with a parent who is a workaholic can ha be more damaging than living with a parent who is an alcoholic. And uh, workaholics are often trying to escape from something within themselves. If you're a true workaholic, and I'm talking about, I worked with people who work 80, 90 hours a week. And on weekends, if they take an hour off, they, uh, they collapse and actually start crying. And they can't say why they're crying, but they're, the nervous system our nervous system is composed of uh, the parasympathetic, which is the rest and digest response, and the stress response, which is fight or flight. And when we're working uh, nonstop, without cushions, without time breaks, without balance, we're, it's, it's like driving a car and going 90 miles an hour. And I've done it, and I, and, and I don't do that anymore, although I still work and I love my work. I feel like I'm leading it. It's not leading me. 
But what happens is if, you, if you've got your sympathetic nervous system or your fight or flight going 24-7, you're going to burn out. Uh, and we've got to have breaks. We've got to have B-R-A-K-E-S, breaks. That means something that, to stop the, the um, fight or flight. And an example of that would be meditation. It would be prayer. It would be uh, exercise. It would be... Um, just doing nothing. The Italians have a name, and I can't pronounce the Italian words, but translated, it's the sweetness of doing nothing. And it's a big part of their culture, and it's something that they really prize, that do, the doing nothing is, is like the space in music. If, if there weren't uh, silent spaces in music, it would just be a bunch of noise. So we need to have you know the breaks in our lives. And it, the book is about all of us looking at the balance in our lives, and I divide, uh, I think of life in four quadrants, work, um, relationships, and that includes, you know, parenting and spouses, um, social activity or fun, and then the self. The self would be exercise, nutrition, and the way we treat ourselves on the inside, the way we talk to ourselves. So uh, the book is about even if you're not a workaholic, if, if your life's out of balance, it's how to find balance and um, live a life that's uh, that's more fulfilling. Great. Thank you for that. And, you know, in speaking about the fight or flight response, I always find it to be so fascinating because obviously we're not faced with many of the, you know, original fight or flight uh, threats, you right. know. Of, of where we are today. But what I find fascinating is how long people can go before that breakdown happens. It's almost like there's a resilience in the yeah. fight or flight brain, you know, that yeah. keeps people going, keeps people, you know, revving up and staying in that state. Um, that's amazing to me how long people can be in it for. That's true. I think we're, we're wired for resilience. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, we're wired to, uh, to see threat when threat's not even there. And uh, so our bodies, you know, respond to to whatever we think. And uh, the, the key uh, with this new research and, and these new therapeutic techniques is to flip that around a little bit and use the, put the brakes on in order to bring more balance to the uh, stress response. There are certain techniques we use, one of which is called grounding is let's say if I'm stressed or somebody just pulled out in front of me and I slammed on brakes and my heart's pounding, I can actually ground myself. It's a very simple technique, but it works. I've used it uh, before eye surgery when um, and before they gave me the, the joy juice to keep my, myself calm. And it's where you just imagine your feet on the floor and you bring all your attention, if you're sitting up, uh, bring all your attention to that place where your feet's connected with the floor, and you just focus there for just a few seconds. And as you do that, you start to notice uh, your body starts calming down. And then you can, if you, if you have a back to the chair, you bring all your attention to where you feel the back of the chair and focus in that spot. And you'll start to notice as you pay attention to the support of the back of the chair and just really stay focused there for a few seconds, you'll start to feel your heart rate slow down, your muscles loosen, your, your breathing slow down. So those simple exercises, we can do, I've done them on a gurney before surgery, like I said, I've done it on an airplane when the captain comes on and says, we got to turn back around and go back to LAX. We have an engine problem. And I realized I just missed my connection. And so I was going to get home two days late. But instead of freaking out and getting upset, here's where you learn to keep your body regulated. And as you do that, here's the amazing thing. We know that if we practice that regularly, you widen your resilience zone. And what that means is, uh, you start to notice that you're not as reactive to life, life's curveballs. When things don't go the way you thought they would or the way you want, you're able, and this happened to me this week, you're able to say, okay, that, that's okay, and not, you know, pound your fist or shake your fist at the heavens or scream or yell. I just did a, um, a 
a launch of my new book, Daily Writing Resilience, and had a huge crowd, 110 people. And the plan was that Sarah Gruen, who wrote Water for Elephants, would interview me. That was the setup. Well, Sarah got the flu at the last minute and wasn't able to be there. So there's a time when I would have freaked out. I did gulp. And after the gulp, I thought, okay, I can handle this. I felt my resilience. The reason I felt my resilience is because this is something I personally practice, Mm -hmm. is I I, I practice widening that resilience zone. Then I got the notice that I live here in Asheville where we've had single-digit temperatures and snow and ice, and my heat went out at my house, and it was the weekend. We were going to have like 10 degrees uh, weather. And so my spouse was not able to come because my spouse had to stay home and take care of all that. But again, how do we how do we handle these things? These are these are not things that are personal. Life's not against us. It's just life. And once we realize that and we're able to regulate ourselves, we bring ourselves above the survival level and we're able to enjoy life more and actually see life in a whole different way. Yeah. And when we expand that resilience zone that you talked about, uh, you know, the words that I usually like to use too, is that we become more of a person that responds to life versus react to life. That's right. I love that. That's well said, April. Another way of thinking about it is uh, this is happening for me instead of to me. To me. Yeah. Yep. If, I, yeah. if I think about, okay, this is happening for me, it empowers me and allows me to think, okay, now what am I learning here? One of the things I learned from those two experiences, I felt that grass inside me growing through concrete. It build, it builds your confidence over time. It helps you not worry. You know things are going to turn out okay. Um, so it's it's um, it's a great way to uh, uh, even if you don't go to therapy, you can practice some of these techniques. And by the way, I have the grounding is one of the daily meditations that tells you how to do it step by step. But these are the kind of things that are in daily writing resilience, how to get through life in a more positive way. Yeah. And in the book, I decided, all right, let me skip to my birthday and see what April 17th says. (laughs) It's fun with numbers and dates. So uh, on April 17th, it is outlast defeat. And you have a beautiful quote by Maya Angelou. And I'll read that. It's uh, the quote is, in fact, it may be necessary to encounter the defeats so you can know who you are, what you can rise from and how you can still come out of it. That's just what we were just talking about, too. Yes, that's perfect. Yes. And the takeaway for that day. So it was kind of talking about, you know, when we fall short of our goals and feeling successful or feeling the defeat. And the takeaway on April 17th is as you encounter writing defeats, reign victorious by being true to yourself. Learn what you can rise from and never participate in someone else's underestimation of your ability. Yeah, I want to say something about that. Uh, You know what? A lot of us. When we fail or when something goes awry, we kick ourselves around. We don't even think about it. We don't even realize it. And the key is to not do that. The key is if we're met with defeat, instead of joining whoever is underestimating us, is to hold ourselves in high regard. That is so important. This whole idea of self-compassion is a tool in and of itself. You know, if something happens and I'm disappointed, why would I beat myself up? You know, why not uh, put my arms around myself and talk myself off the ledge and say, okay, this, this sucks, but you know, we'll try it again. We'll keep on going. This whole idea of self-compassion helps us get back in the saddle and, and move forward. But when we beat ourselves up and join in the people who are defeating us or making us feel bad, then we're less likely to be able to reach our goals. Yes, absolutely. And I know that you do have your own private practice in Asheville, North Carolina. We do have a lot of listeners from that area. So uh, don't be surprised if your phone starts to ring a little bit more, but how many, uh, how many clients do you hold as a caseload and how, you know, how large is your practice? Are you still seeing clients or is your practice full? Well, It is full, uh, but full for me is uh, I'm only in the office on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and a half day Thursday. So uh, I have long weekends and uh, a half day on Thursday. And so within that time, I see somewhere around 15 to 20 people a week, I would imagine. 
Um, but I keep it that way so that I can, I love my private practice and I love working with people and I love my clients and I love writing. And, uh, I'm, I, I love the, uh, interplay between the two. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, for, for me, that's pretty full. But yeah. if it wants to, you know, uh, contact me, we can talk about how that can happen. Great. And do you also um, do any workshops or teaching in the area that if, you know, people aren't able to work with you one-on-one, um, do you give any lectures or anything like that now? Well, occasionally I do. I'm doing a workshop actually in Greenville, South Carolina at Fiction Addiction. That's a bookstore uh, on January 27th. Uh, and it's a two hour workshop uh, on writing resilience. So anybody, you don't have to be published. You don't have to, you know, certainly don't have to be well known, but if you just write in a diary, that's fine. But the, the workshop is about how to stay in there and how to develop a winning frame of mind. Some of the things we've been talking about and, and using some of the techniques that are in the book. Uh, the only fee is uh, the cost of the book that you buy at Fiction Addiction, and that's your ticket to get in to the workshop. And that's 10 o'clock, 10 to 12, January 27th. Great. And can you also let our listeners know where they can find your books, um, your website, and, you know, the best way to, you know, just get all of the great works and, uh, and books that you've already published? Well, the books are, of course, on Amazon.com. I like to support independent bookstores like Malaprops is our bookstore here in Asheville. It's one of the best bookstores in the, in the country. It has a cafe, and you can come and sit and read books and have coffee and lattes and so forth. But anywhere books are sold, uh, Barnes & Noble and so forth, my website is brianrobinsonbooks.com. That's B-R-Y-A-N robinsonbooks.com and there's information about all the workshops and, and all the places I will be and uh, information about the books. You can order those books on my website as well and some of the other books that I've written and some of the uh, pieces that I've done for Psychology Today. It's all on my website. Great. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on the Path 11 podcast. This was a new type of uh, topic for us to discuss about, but I always feel, you know, when certain books come across my desk to review and to have people on as a guest that usually there are listeners out there that need to hear the message from the person that I'm interviewing. So I really enjoyed the daily writing resilience. I do believe that it's something that can be used even if you're not a writer. So I would highly recommend the book to our listeners. And I really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much, April. I enjoyed it, too. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that show. And don't forget to sign up for our premium service with over 100 hours of interviews, as well as our new segments such as Two Minute Tuesdays, Food for Thought Fridays, as well as the Virtual Book Club on Thursdays. All of these extra segments are only available for our premium subscribers. Visit the podcast section of our website at path11productions.com to learn more or to start your subscription for only $3.99 a month. If you're not interested in a premium subscription, you can still use our smartphone app for both Android and iPhones. Just search for Path 11 in the Google Play App Store, or if on an iPhone, look for Path 11 in the iOS App Store. Of course, you can still catch our latest five interview shows at any time by subscribing to the Path 11 podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, and iHeartRadio. If you want more information about our films, visit our website, path11productions.com, to purchase DVDs or to rent and stream each film. You can also find our trilogy of films on iTunes, Amazon Prime, and Gaia.com. Catch you next time.